we have the pleasure of presenting on behalf of Team Forget It for you all tonight. Now, our project deals with the pathology of concussion, with the ultimate goal of developing a remedy for the injury. Now, by far, concussions are the biggest threat to athletes participating in contact sports. The Center for Disease Control Prevention estimates that anywhere from 1.6 to 3.8 million concussions occur annually in just the United States alone. Even more telling is a 2014 study conducted by the Public Broadcasting Service, which estimates that upwards of 80% of retired NFL players experience some form of degenerative brain damage after their playing career as a result of repeated head injuries. Now, while professional athletes generally get a lot of the media coverage and the hype surrounding the concussion crisis, it's very important to remember that college athletes, high school athletes, and youth athletes, youth athletes run the risk of sustaining concussions by the sheer virtue of participating in contact sports. Now, the biggest risk associated with concussions is something known as second impact syndrome, or SIS. Second impact syndrome occurs when you sustain a second concussion or head injury during the recovery of the first concussion. And it's because it has such an exponentially uh, increasing result in the symptoms that it's so dangerous. And because of this, it's ultimately the niche of our project, where we want to develop a treatment that not only can protect, pr protect against the second hit, but also reduce the uh, recovery time of the first hit. Now, as you can see, the symptoms of the first hit, while they to be taken very seriously, are generally really mild. Things such as headache, memory loss, and dizziness overall will not disrupt your quality of life. And with a recovery period of about a week, four to 14 days is generally the uh, overwhelmingly accepted range by most physicians. You can recover from it quickly, get on with school, get on with work, get on with your life, essentially. However, it's when you sustain that second hit, things such as amnesia, which is permanent memory loss, changing sleep patterns, or sensitivity to any lights or sounds, these are things that can severely derail your quality of life and provide extra hindrance in your daily basis. As well, um, the recovery time for the second hit can range anywhere from one month to two months. So this is something that can really decommission you from athletics, from school, and from your work. And it's also important to note that in the most severe cases, respiratory arrest, coma, and even death are possible. So now that we've discussed a lot of the issues surrounding uh, the concussion crisis facing athletes, it's very important to understand the biological mechanisms and the proceeds behind the injury itself. So what actually happens during a concussion is the axons themselves are actually mechanically stretched out. Now when this happens, the, the gated ion channels that are located in the axon themselves are also forcefully opened, causing an influx of ions to rush into the neuron itself. And this obviously causes a giant imbalance in the neuron itself. So what happens is the neuron will try to use their gated ion channels in order to pump these ions out. However, doing this takes up energy in the form of ATP. In addition, a concussion also causes something called reactive oxygen species, which will cause something else called lipid peroxidation, which I'll get to later in this presentation. But the key thing here is that altogether these cause a large energy, energy deficit in the brain, which can really be attributed to a lack of glucose. So for the neuron to counteract this, the, the brain tries to bring in more glucose via the use of two glucose transporters, GLUT1 and GLUT3. Now a reactive oxygen species is something that's usually normally formed in the, in the body during um, cellular respiration. In the uh, quantities it's formed usually, it's not actually harmful at all, it can be disposed of very readily. However, during the concussion, it's actually overproduced, so the mitochondria can't actually get rid of it fast enough, which will obviously cause a large chemical imbalance. This chemical imbalance will really take form in, most, most, most specifically, lipid peroxidation, which is essentially when these ROS uh, particles react with the lipids in the cell membrane, causing little small holes to form, which, uh, which will happen, which will allow for more ions to flow into the cell. So this overproduction is actually very harmful for the cell to happen. And again, it will it'll increase the need for ATP, which will also increase the need for glucose. So the current research on the subject actually is mainly focused on a traumatic brain injury. Now, a concussion is classified as a mild traumatic brain injury, or MTBI for short, which, although they're very similar to traumatic brain injuries, there are a few key differences that are noted in the literature. So what the niche that our project really wants to fill is the interaction between GLUT1 and GLUT3, as I mentioned earlier, which are the two glucose transporters in the brain, uh, hexokinase, which is a key enzyme that metabolizes glucose, as well as lipid peroxidation and reactive oxygen species. We want to measure all of these in a mild traumatic brain injury. The, um, so far, the, the interplay between all these elements is currently unknown, so this is what we really want to do with our hopeful publication. And one last thing is most of the studies that are on the market so far really take place in vivo, meaning they use a mouse or a rabbit, rabbit model to really mimic a concussion, so they'll actually concuss the rabbit or the, or the mouse or the rabbit and will actually cause a concussion like that. However, our study uh, takes place 
in vitro, meaning we're going to use actual um, human cells. So we have benefit concussion with the cells themselves, therefore eliminating a lot of variables, variables that come, up, come about using animal model. So our hypothesis really is as follows, that a concussion will really alter the, the three the elements you talked about, like glucose transport and reactive oxygen species. And they'll alter them in the three cell types that are made up by the blood-brain barrier. Um, neurons, astrocytes, and endothelial cells. In addition, we also hypothesize that antioxidants, most notably vitamin E, may be actual, actually be helpful to protect against the detrimental effects of a concussion. So we, we split our research up into three different aims. The first aim really um, seeks to look at the elements of glucose transport, most notably glu glu one glu 3 and hexokinase. The second aim examines oxidative stress levels, which will determine using the levels of ROS produced in the cell, as well as the rate of lipid peroxidation. And lastly, a third aim will really seek to look at cell damage, which we'll look at via cell liability. And in each of these three aims, we'll, we'll seek to look at A, after injury, and then B, after treatment with the vitamin E and oxygen treatments. Uh, so our experimental groups are as follows. We're essentially going to break this down into four different experimental groups. The first experimental group is the control of just normal, healthy cells. The second experimental group is with one hit, meaning we're going to concuss the cell once. Uh, our third experimental group is two hits, meaning we're going to concuss the cell once, wait a certain period of time, and then concuss the cell again. And then the final experimental group is with treatment with vitamin E. So we'll concuss the cell once, we'll incubate the cells with vitamin E for a fixed amount of time, and then we'll concuss the cells again. And so far, the research we've conducted so far, that people will get to in a second, will have so far been talking with healthy cells, and then we've so far focused on AIMS 1 and 3, meaning AIMS with glucose transport elements as well as something. Uh, as Ashwin said, we're doing all of our studies in vitro, which means we do our experiments on cultured cells. And uh, we employ three different cell types, HPMCs, which are our endothelial cells, astrocytes, and neuroblastomas. And uh, our barrier with Anna has been in charge of plating and culturing those cells, and she's done a great job of that. Um, in order to determine the relative, uh, or the concentration of the glucose transporters, uh, not only glut uh, glu one, which we've done so far, we employ the Western blot technique. Uh, and the Western blot technique allows us to determine the relative densities uh, of the glu one protein uh, in each of our cells. And what we found was that there is a dose-dependent increase in the glucose transporter expression uh, with an increased doses of H2O2. Uh, we use hydrogen peroxide in our studies now uh, to mimic the oxidative stress that occurs during a concussion. Uh, and is, is uh, the medium for which we mimic the concussion during our, uh, during our preliminary experiments. And what we found was that more H2O2 uh, yields more glucose transporters in the cell, indicating that uh, an injury, oxidative stress, will uh, increase the cell's glucose uptake. Uh, so using the Western plot, we found that glucose, uh, glu the glu one transporter increases during an injury. And uh, we also employed a, uh, a technique in which we were able to determine where this glu one protein uh, localized in the cell in the event of an injury. Uh, we used, we used a, uh, an assay that uses antibodies, fluorescence microscopy. You can see some beautiful images here uh, with the blue dye labeling the cell's nucleus, the green dye labeling the glu one protein. And what we saw was in an injured cell with our oxidative stress uh, introduction, we saw that the glucose transporters migrated towards uh, the cell membrane, uh, which is where they need to be to take up glucose into the cell. Uh, which is uh, consistent with our hypothesis that injury will increase the cell's glucose uptake. Uh, another parameter we use to measure cell injury during oxidative stress is something called cell morphology, which measures the shape of the cell and how uh, the cell's membrane is, uh, is affected during the event, the event of an injury. And uh, we measure this using a few different parameters, average circularity of the cells, because during the injury, uh, the, the membrane will be compromised and the circularity will be lost. The average area of the cells is during the injury, the cells will shrink in size. The average gap between the cells is during the injury, the cells will, uh, will migrate away from each other and reduce their confluency. And the fair diameter of the cells, which measures the cell's longest, uh, longest point, or longest side. What we found was that in the injured cells, uh, the circularity decreased the average area decreased and the average gap between the cells decreased, uh, all consistent with our, um, with the injured model that we determined uh, with, the glute, uh, with the glute experiments that injury occurs during oxidative stress. Uh, we did not find significant dis dis uh, difference in the fair diameter of the cells. Um, another 
another uh, parameter we measured was cell viability, really which cells are alive, which cells are dead. And uh, we employed a technique, questions microscopy as well, and we used, uh, we incubated the cells with uh, dyes, flesh and dyes, which labeled alive cells green, as you can see on the screen, and dead cells red. Uh, and we measured this in the control group and an injured, injured group. What we found was that in the injured cells, uh, there was a marked decrease in the number of alive cells and an uh, increase in the number of dead cells. Uh, you can see on the picture on the right, have also has less numbers of cells. Uh, in our injured groups, uh, we found that there was a total uh, decrease in the number of cells, the total number of cells, uh, which indicates that during, during the injury, the cells die and will detach from the membrane, uh, making so that there is less, there's less cells uh, in our, in our uh, samples. Now, as Ashley mentioned earlier, our project is divided into three primary aims. Each one deals with a certain facet of the concussion process which we're researching. Currently, we're focusing exclusively on AIM-1, glucose transport across the blood-brain barrier, as well as AIM-3, assessing cell viability before and after the injury. Our goal for the remainder of the semester is first to purchase the cell injury controller, which is an apparatus that will actually let us replicate the symptoms of concussed cells instead of working with just uh, injured cells. From there, we want to complete our experimental groups for AIM-1 and AIM-3, and we also want to begin the, uh, the control groups for AIM-2, which is oxidative stress. Now, to surprise no one, we face a number of challenges being on the undergraduate research team. One of the biggest ones we anticipated coming in was funding. Uh, just frankly put, biology projects are very expensive, and our budget runs upwards of $20,000. So initially, we were very concerned with being able to fund our project, and we combated this by applying for a number of grants early on. We were very fortunate to receive grants not only through the university and through Gemstone, but by through a number of third-party sources as well. In addition to this, we recently partnered with an on-campus organization, UMD Launch, which provides a platform for crowdsource funding by which we're able to receive donations from friends, family, and alumni to help fundraise our project. From this, we were able to raise about a quarter of our expected budget. However, one of the biggest challenges we did not anticipate coming in and proved to be one of the more costly was communication. It can be very difficult to function on a team of 10 members and ensure that every single person is on the same page. On top of that, it's also very difficult to make sure you have a collective identity, a collective opinion, and to translate that between your mentor, between experts, and between the Gemstone program. For us, it's basically a weekly battle. We have to make sure we're all on the same page. It takes a lot of dedication at our weekly meetings, as well as outside our meetings, to make sure we're all on the same page and all doing our work. Biggest piece of a, the biggest piece of the, pieces of advice we have to freshmen Number one, it sounds cliche, but be willing to have an open mind and try something new. I'm a mechanical engineering major, and I'm working with brain cells. Honestly, it's something I would never be able to do except for the gemstone program. It's part of the multidisciplinary aspect, so don't be afraid to step out of your comfort zone and do something you wouldn't normally get the chance to do. Part of that, we have 10 different members on our team. We also have 10 different majors. You have to have a welcoming and inclusive team dynamic because everyone's going to bring something unique to your team, and in order to be successful, each person needs to be individually successful and put in a position for them to succeed. One of the biggest things uh, for the freshmen also, your project will change. What you're working on right now in GEMS 100 for your project sheet will not be what you're proposing at the end of freshman year, and it's certainly not what you're going to be presenting right now at Junior Colloquia. So you have to be able to anticipate these changes and learn to work with them, both individually and as a team. And finally, work should always be the primary focus for your GEMS team. It can be very easy to get caught up in the social aspect of Gemstone. It is a living learning program. It's a great opportunity to work with your friends, to meet new friends, and to meet new people. But do not let that distract you from getting work done. Part of that, do not be afraid to take charge and ensure that things are completed in a timely manner. <coughs> Ultimately, the success or failure of your project comes down to you and the effort you put in. Finally, we just want to give a special thanks to Dr. Sylvia Murrow, who's our mentor and was very instrumental in helping us with our experimentation and design process. The Murrow Lab Group, through all their help, uh, we started a lab this semester, so just the normal growing pains and training with the lab. Dr. Scandal and Dr. Cole for all their help over the past two and a half years. UMD launched to everyone who donated. Uh, a couple days ago, we met our goal, and we're very excited about that, so just a big thank you to everyone who participated. Mrs. Nevenka Zrankowska, our librarian, and finally, just everyone part of the Gemstone program, especially Vicki Hill for all the help with the financial matters. Any questions? Now that's a pretty general
general uh, thing to use during dynamic oxidative stress in vitro. We, we're really sure we've done that. Okay, so you mentioned a lot of the um, symptoms of depression stem from the entire axon being stressed. Actually, we're doing these three cell types right now by themselves. We're doing experiments by themselves, and uh, eventually we're going to uh, employ a technique uh, where we use a transwell model, which uh, actually mimics the blood-brain barrier between those three cell types. And uh, from there, we'll be able to determine the interaction between the cell types and uh, a better model of the brain as a whole. So, like, how much do you, uh already is actually shown to have multiple, um, uh, I guess the right word would be, um, well it's, it's shown to reduce um, oxidative stress in different models, so we want to see if uh, oxidative stress caused by concussion that also applies to that, will concussion cause um, oxidative stress also be reduced by concussion? Yeah, in the initial literature we found vitamin E um, was able to reduce oxidative stress in traumatic brain injuries, and as Ash mentioned earlier, concussions are a subset of traumatic brain injuries classified as minor traumatic brain injuries, and that has not been studied yet. So we're just kind of relating it to thinking that there's a positive correlation there, and that's really one of the aims of our research to explore that. It was actually created by a research at uh, BC University. So, what it does actually is it um, it brings up like a, an air pulse in like a fixed amount of time. Um, the I guess pressure and time intervals are actually set by the researchers who created the thing itself. We can, we can set it so it's, I believe it was like actually camera with the PSI off the top of my head. But what it does is essentially it would mimic the axonal stretch that was consistent with the myelogenetic brain injury. <coughs> Just um, the amount of time we have, we only have about like two years to do our research. So, a lot of it's also dedicated to really looking at the glucose transport elements as well as reactive oxygen species. Um, adding in different concentrations of different gradients of vitamin E would uh, honestly take a lot more time than we have, to put it frankly, and a lot more money than we have. So, we decided to go with just one concentration of vitamin E, which in the literature has shown in at least a traumatic brain injury to make a difference. So, we want to use that concentration for a monotonic. Um, a, long, a long time after. So the two time points I believe we um, 
uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that we decided to um, go up in our one hour and then 24 hours. So would do, for example, in one hour would mimic, you know, four, okay, one five and 24, sorry. So like the one hour concussion would mimic, you know, an athlete coming back from the game an hour after concussion and getting hit again, while 24 hours would be, you know, waiting a full day, really, before coming back from the playing field. Also, like, a lot of the uh, chemical effects that occur uh, after the mechanic, uh, initial uh, injury, it takes, like, uh, a few hours for uh, those things to manifest themselves fully. So uh, that's how we kind of, you know, chose the time points that we're uh, testing.